The same waves that wash Bangkok also touch Malaysia and South Vietnam and the Philippines. And the waves move out, they wash against South Korea and Australia and New Zealand. And many thousands of miles away, the same Pacific waves touch my own nation at Hawaii and Alaska and California. These waves speak of the deepest meanings of my journey, that we are Pacific neighbors with a common destiny. President Lyndon Johnson journeyed to the Pacific in 1966 because he was invited to the Manila Summit Conference of Seven Nations and because he needed to see for himself the changing face of Asia. I will go to see and to listen and to learn and to act with our partners to bring an honorable peace to Southeast Asia at the first day that it is possible. The President's trip would cover the Pacific, starting with New Zealand and Australia, then the Manila Summit Conference of Nations Allied in the Vietnam War, then Thailand and Malaysia, and finally Korea. On such a wide-ranging trip, most men are absorbed in the plans, the events, and the news of the moment. But a President is concerned with generations. There are many searching questions that we can ask. How well have we understood the feelings and aspirations of Asia's people? How well have we understood the course of revolution? How well have we understood the shifting tides of nationalism in all of its forms? American policy must be the policy of an open mind. Mr. President, Mrs. Johnson, ladies and gentlemen, and particularly boys and girls, can I suggest that each and every one of you follow the example of the, the President? The Honorable Keith Holyoke, Prime Minister of New Zealand, greeted the President and Mrs. Johnson. Mr. And Mrs. Johnson. So, on behalf of the people of New Zealand and the government of New Zealand, I extend to you both a very warm, a very human welcome, a thousand welcomes to you both. And on behalf of the Maori people who've already welcomed you in their language, Kia Ora. Good luck and good health. Mr. Prime Minister, Mrs. Holyoke, Mr. Meach, Mr. White, my friends of New Zealand, I want to thank you for coming here in this. Uh, rainy weather, exposing yourself to give us this uh, neighborly welcome. And if you will be good enough, I hope that you will wish me on my return to have the same kind of rainy reception at my home ranch in Texas as I'm getting here today. David. David. On October 20th, the President and Mrs. Johnson arrived in Wellington, New Zealand.
came by jet from Hawaii and Samoa, riding the smooth jet stream at more than 500 miles an hour. Ms. Johnson and I are quite honored to be in New Zealand. Physically, we have not uh, entirely adjusted to the southern hemisphere after our long flight, but you may be sure that our hearts are already in residence. And it was quite a change from our last arrival in New Zealand in uh, the spring of 1942, when both nations faced very grim problems together. Your welcome was as warm then as it was today, although not as numerous. But it was outgoing, and it was generous. New Zealanders twice left these beautiful islands to fight for the freedom and liberty of all men. Ours was a unity of nations who longed to live in peace, but who understood from the bitter lessons of two wars what the consequences of appeasement would be. Every man wants peace. That's something that all of you should uh, take uh, cognizance of now. You can't separate men by those who want peace and those who don't want peace. Every man wants peace. The president's itinerary in every country included private talks with government leaders and, whenever possible, visits to rural areas. Westward in the late afternoon, the President and Mrs. Johnson flew 1,300 miles from New Zealand to Australia. They were met by Prime Minister and Mrs. Harold Holt. come back to Australia since I left here 25 years ago. And here I am, and I'm happy, and I'm enjoying it. And I liked it then, and I like it better now. I need not uh, convey to you the admiration and affection that uh, I have for the Australian people. I have so much in my heart that I would like to tell you that I don't uh, trust myself. very deeply, and certainly those who feel very vocally that our common engagement in Vietnam is morally wrong. There is, I believe, the view of a minority. Because we have put our trust in democracy, we are bound to preserve the minority's right to express its opinion. 
But it is exactly because we are democracies that we cannot be turned aside from policies that the great majority of our public support and for which they have made profound sacrifices. <laughs> We're going to Manila to try to find a formula for peace, to try to review our military operations, to try to exchange views with the, the leaders of seven countries. We don't expect any magic wonders. We don't expect any miracles. But we do think that each nation who has men committed to die, their leaders ought to get around the table and get the best thinking of the best men those nations uh, can send. On behalf of my people, I extend warm and affectionate welcome to each and every one. President Ferdinand Marcos of the Republic of the Philippines proposed and presided over the Manila Summit Conference. I greet President Park Chung-hee of the Republic of Korea. I greet Prime Minister Sanum Kitikachorn of Thailand. I greet Chairman Nguyen Van Thieu of the Republic of Vietnam. I greet Prime Minister Nguyen Kauke of the Republic of Vietnam. I greet Prime Minister Harold Holt of Australia. I greet Prime Minister Case Holyoke of New Zealand. And I greet President Lyndon B. Johnson of the United States of America. <laughs> there is a fresh new wind that sweeps over the face of Asia, and Asia can no longer accept Western formulas without questioning nor participation. At the Malacan Yang Palace, the leaders went into two days of private working meetings. To each and every one of you again I say, greetings, mabuhay, and thank you. After the doors were closed, a watching world was kept informed through special releases and briefings at the International Press Center.
Over 2,000 newsmen from more than 70 nations were covering the conference. While their husbands met together, the first ladies went on excursions arranged by their hostess, Mrs. Marcos. The leaders agreed upon a declaration of four principles for peace. First, aggression must fail. Second, the bonds of hunger, illiteracy, and disease must be broken. Third, regional cooperation must be increased. Finally, former enemies must learn to live together in peace. Of this conference, it is now my privilege and pleasure to uh, make the final statement of the conference. First of all, I wish to extend my thanks and gratitude. The leaders also issued a joint communique on Vietnam. They pledged that Allied forces would be withdrawn within six months, provided that, quote, the other side withdraws its forces to the north, ceases infiltration, and the level of violence then subsides. Close quote. Beyond that, the leaders also pledged not to invade North Vietnam, to grant amnesty to South Vietnamese who had been misled or coerced into the Viet Cong, to give top priority to land reform and social welfare in South Vietnam, and to hold elections within six months after completion of the new constitution. My pleasure and honor now to declare closed the Manila Summit Conference of 1966. <laughs> Wednesday, October 26th, President Johnson's final day in Manila was a particularly busy one. In the morning, he had gone with President Marcos to visit the island of Corregidor, which Philippine and American fighting men had held together during World War II until their food ran out. Then the President went to the Philippine and American cemeteries. In the afternoon, he was to address the American community at the embassy. And in between, he visited the International Rice Research Institute to see experimental techniques of rice culture. In its short four years of existence, this institute has produced promising new strains of rice yield, which are now being planted in the soil of many countries. One strain developed here has been called the Miracle Rice. I am glad to know that the institute is prepared to make these seeds available to all nations, to all nations, whatever their politics and ideology. Because if we are to win our war, and the only important war that really counts, if we're to win our war against poverty and against disease and against ignorance and against illiteracy, 
and against hungry stomachs, then we have got to succeed in projects like this. And you are pointing the way for all of Asia to follow. And I hope they're looking. I hope they're listening. And I hope they're following. The president's next scheduled stop was at the American embassy. But he never got there. For many days, there had been speculation that the president might visit Vietnam. But when? A visit to a war zone could not be announced in advance. Most guessing centered on Thursday, his first day in Thailand. So he went from Manila on Wednesday, when it was least expected. Every man wants peace. That's something that all of you should uh, take uh, cognizance of now. You can't separate men by those who want peace and those who don't want peace. Every man wants peace. Every man uh, hates to kill. Thursday, October 27th at Bang San, Thailand the president took a day of rest by the sea and had private talks with Prime Minister Kitty Kachorn. The next morning, the president and Mrs. Johnson flew to Bangkok, where they were met by King Bhumapol and Queen Sirikit. <laughs> Within the Grand Palace grounds, the Lord Chamberlain and other court officials were presented to the President and Mrs. Johnson. King Bhumapol and President Johnson also exchanged gifts. Friday night, October 28th, Their Majesties, the King and Queen, gave a state banquet in honor of the President and Mrs. Johnson. received guests in the west wing of the Chakri Throne Hall of the Grand Palace. After the banquet, they went to the National Theatre for a special performance 
of Thai classical dance. In the morning, Mrs. Johnson cruised in the royal motorboat along the Bang Luang Canal to the floating market, Wat Sai. Our goal is an elementary one. It is this, to give each man in the world a chance to seek the highest and the deepest of the human experience as he sees fit. And you are doing that today here in Thailand. Your educational progress is exciting and it is matched by material progress as well. You have applied modern technology to agriculture, making Thailand the world's leading exporter of rice. At Chulalongkorn University, the president received an honorary doctorate in political science. From Thailand, the presidential plane flew south 750 miles across the Gulf of Siam to Malaysia. This was the 13th day of the president's journey. <laughs> yeah. At Kuala Lumpur, the president and Mrs. Johnson were met by His Majesty, the young Deportuanagong, and Her Majesty, the Raja Poor Mysuri Agong. Tuan Yang Terutama, Tuan Presiden, Beta dan Raja Permasuri Agong, sungguh berasa besar hati dan sukacita kerana Tuan pemimpin rakyat negara Amerika yang masyhur sudi datang ke tanah Malaysia ini. Conclusion of His Majesty's speech. Mr. President, we are proud and happy indeed to welcome you, the leader of the great American people, to the shores of Malaysia. Your state visit to our country is the first ever embarked upon by an American president. Mr. President, during your stay here, you will meet ordinary folk doing about their daily business. You will see a small nation busily engaged in the pursuit of peace. We have had plenty of trouble after independence, but by the grace of God, we have emerged none the worse for it. I'm delighted to be here in Malaysia. I feel that I know you because Malaysia, like the United States, is a federation of states which were once colonies of Great Britain. And because Malaysia is, like the United States, a nation of many diverse peoples. Though I feel that I know you, I have come here to learn from you. I know that your nation is a model of what may be done by determined and far-sighted men 
in Southeast Asia. Fifteen years ago, the city where we spend the night was a city of conflict. You were absorbed in fighting the terrorists. Your streets were filled with soldiers, and your hospitals were filled with the wounded. Malaysia was traveling that difficult road along which one of your great neighbors, South Vietnam, tonight toils with such sacrifice. Yet here today, we have seen the future and what it can hold for a troubled country. We see a bright and thriving and modern capital bursting with energy. We see an inspiring new mosque symbolizing your trust in God. We see a beautiful new museum. We see new buildings and new industries that mark your great economic advance and progress. Three of the world's great peoples have come together here in your nation. They are people who differ in many ways, but who have the will to live together in both peace and harmony and with a sense of nationhood. I know of your many accomplishments how you have made land available to the landless, how you have improved rural health services and rural education. Abu Jaya village is one of 67 land development projects in Malaysia. Fifteen years ago, this area was virgin jungle, sheltering communist guerrillas. In 1960, the government cleared the jungle and planted rubber trees. Farmers who had lived in poverty were given the opportunity to own the land they worked. The government also built homes. Each family pays for its home and land over a 12-year period. You have demonstrated that an independent nation can rise from long years of bitter struggle to create economic prosperity and to lead in regional cooperation. Wherever the president goes, the White House goes with him. His plane carries a complete office staff, press secretaries, and a group of key presidential advisors. He signed bills into law while traveling northeast across the China Sea, 2,800 miles toward the final stop of his journey, Korea.
President Johnson and President Chung Hee Park of Korea plan private talks after the welcoming ceremonies at Seoul City Hall. My Korean friends, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for the warmth of your welcome. I thank you for your courage and for your friendship and for the testimony that you are giving to the promise of freedom in the world. Sixteen years ago, an event occurred in Korea that changed the shape of Asia and the world. When the fighting stopped, Korea faced every conceivable difficulty. Millions of refugees, transportation in ruin, its cities in ashes. Here is one of the truly dramatic stories of our time, a nation transformed within a generation. It is the intelligence and the energy and the hard work and the genius of the Korean people that are creating a new future for your country. From the air, I saw how you had turned the circular oval plots into large productive squares and thus increased the production in excess of 35%. We can see great evidence of flood control, irrigation, and reforestation of your hills. This hill, from this day forward, would be known as Johnson Hill.
After a journey of 17 days, seven nations, and 31,000 miles, a brief moment in history, a tired president headed home. I have seen the palaces and the universities, the ordinary homes and the village schools, the new land development and the new strains of rice. I have seen cabinet members and school children, farm experts and village leaders and our fighting men. I have seen millions of faces, friendly and well-wishing, and I have been deeply encouraged.